Thank you, Deborah, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm going to discuss a little bit, uh, I'm going to do a historical overview of how e-cigarettes were first invented, then started to appear in the market, and where are we now? So, uh, this is my conflict of interest, the same as yesterday, nothing changed from yesterday. Unfortunately, no new sponsor, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> The first relevant to e-cigarette uh, patent that I found was in 1934. And you can see here in, this, uh, in these figures of the, of, the, of the device that they proposed, it is basically a tank which contains liquid. There is a coil just above the liquid but without any wick. And there is a battery. That was a proposal for an inhalational device they didn't discuss about substituting tobacco cigarettes or anything, but they say that you could inhale some volatile substances or even some medications by heating the coil that you see here. When the coil is close to the liquid, it can evaporate the liquid, and this is the air flow into the chamber so that you will have some new air coming in which will draw the aerosol uh, into your mouth. Another one in 1936 also used the wick. Uh, so they were proposing something very similar, but with the use of a wicking material, which through a capillary effect, as they said, quite close of what, what's happening now with the cigarettes, uh, they would draw the liquid from the uh, bottom towards the place where you have a metal coil, and they were using a flashlight, they were suggesting the use of a flashlight battery, and they said that they could work this at two or three volts easily and generate aerosol. Of course, we have the well-known uh, patent by Zilbert in 1965, uh, who basically was uh, uh, proposing a smokeless non-tobacco cigarette. It's the first time that they proposed something like that. All the previous inventions were basically discussing about delivery of medications through the inhalational route. Uh, uh, from what I know, this has never been uh, uh, prepared as a product to be used or even as a prototype, but that was very close to what uh, we, are, we are seeing uh, today, and uh, today's invention came from uh, Hon Lick, as you, everyone knows, uh, who submitted the patent somewhere in 2004-2005 and got the patent in 2007. Not exactly... Uh, the same as the cigarette that was initially introduced into the market. He was discussing basically about an ultrasound mechanism. But as we know, this is the first type of devices that uh, appeared in the market. They were disposables. The, the part of the atomai of the e-cigarette e containing the liquid and uh, having the evaporation uh, area was um, attached to the battery, you couldn't detach it. Uh, they were single use only, you couldn't recharge the battery. Uh, so you could take as many puffs as until the battery was discharged, very small batteries with very small capacity, less than 100 milliampere hours. And uh, after that, you just threw them away. They looked very much like cigarettes, uh, regular cigarettes, even in size, shape. Uh, in some cases, even the tip, uh, uh, was, uh, you know, soft, resembling the, the, the filter of the tobacco cigarette. These devices delivered minimally any nicotine, although they were usually at uh, nicotine concentrations of 18 milligrams per milliliter. However, they suppressed craving. This is a study from Chris Bullen, and you can see here that, uh, of course, this is the craving suppression from a tobacco cigarette, but you could see a statistically significant suppression even from the use of an e-cigarette and, of course, the nicotine inhaler, although, basically, you had uh, very, very low levels of uh, nicotine uh, absorbed from, uh, from the e-cigarette. Uh, then uh, we had the first generation, again, cigarette-like, but rechargeable, so reusables. Um, so the, you could detach the cartomizer from the uh, battery and you could recharge the battery. Again, the, the, the capacity of the battery was very low due to size constraints, uh, but you could replace the cartomizer, you could throw it away. Some companies still sell some um, unfilled cartomizers, so you can use your own liquid and, and fill them. In many cases, they are pre-filled, so the, once the liquid uh, is consumed, you throw them away and you attach a new pre-filled cartomizer. Uh, this is a dissection from William's study of a cartomizer. 
this is basically how it works. This is a polyfill material which acts like a sponge, and there is no tank system which holds the liquid. It's basically impregnated into this material, and um, th this material is wrapped around this wick and coil, so through the capillary effect, the liquid goes from the polyfill material into the wicking uh, material and into the coil uh, area so that it is evaporated. Not a very efficient mechanism of uh, producing aerosol for many reasons. For example, the polyfill also acts as a sponge and you cannot ever consume all the liquid that is in, that is in there. But that was um, easy to manufacture, cheap, and it looked like a real cigarette. Uh, a study we performed on these first generation devices on uh, nicotine plasma pharmacokinetic study basically so that the absorption of nicotine was much lower than using a newer generation device which you see in the red color. Then that was basically a revolution because we went into another kind of battery, the so-called ego style batteries. Uh, which were much higher in capacity, from three to more than ten times higher in, uh, in, in uh, uh, capacity, uh, which means that uh, some uh, uh, vapors could even use them over the whole day without the need to recharge them, especially the large ones. Um, with these devices, a, a universal connector was also developed, which is commonly called 510 or Ego con uh, connection. So you could attach to the battery different types of atomizers. This is one of the first types of atomizers that were developed together with these batteries, which is, as you see, a completely different system from the uh, previous cartomizer. There is no polyfill material. There is only wicking material, some metal structures, and so on. Uh, a further development of these ego-style batteries was the uh, uh, introduction of some screens to see the battery level and also a puff counter. And a big step, in my opinion, was the introduction of ego-style batteries with uh, adjustable voltage levels. I think these were the, four, the first devices in which you could adjust, the, the, the user could adjust the power delivery to the atomizer. Uh, these batteries were similar in uh, diameter, but a little bit bigger in uh, length than the normal Ego batteries due to the integration of the electronic circuits to adjust the voltage levels. Uh, in, in terms of atomizers, uh, there was a development from uh, the previous system that I showed you to clearomizers, as we call them, and they are called clearomizers because um, the tank uh, part is transparent so that you can see how much liquid is there. Uh, these are the most primitive clearomizers that appeared in the market three or four years ago. Uh, the basic advantage was that you could see how much liquid was there. You could uh, check and uh, know where do you have to uh, put more liquid into the coil. So you avoided any dry puffs. Uh, they were further developed. These are, uh, these are newer systems. Uh, the problem, like with the previous system, was that the coil was at the top. Uh, so that there was movement of liquid from the uh, tank uh, to the wicks and the coil uh, through the capillary flow, but against gravity. So, of course, they thought very easily, very, very fast that that's not a good idea to, to go against gravity. And uh, they developed the bottom coil atomizers, which are basically quite similar in designs, but they didn't need all these long wicks because uh, the wick and coil setup is at the bottom of the atomizer, so they, all the liquid was around it. Uh, the difference with the previous systems was that the temperature of the aerosol was lower because of the bigger distance between the place where the evaporation of the liquid was happening and the uh, tip, uh, the, mouth, the mouthpiece. Uh, so you, the user could feel that the temperature of the aerosol is lower than with the previous systems. Uh, at, at that moment, uh, we saw in the market some what we called mechanical modes. Mechanical modes are basically... Um, tubes, uh, metal tubes, where you could introduce a lithium battery. Uh, and there was a button which activates, uh, provides current from the battery through a universal, again, 510 or Ego type connection uh, to whatever atomizer you would choose. As you can see, some of them were pieces of art, literally. Uh, very nice, aesthetically, very well designed, very heavy, 
mostly stainless steel, some were brass and so on. Um, they were, um, they didn't have any electronics at all. So there was no protection from short circuits. There was no protection from anything. Uh, one advantage of them was that you could increase the power of uh, vaping just by using lower resistance atomizers. So basically, uh, these devices delivered as much voltage as the battery could deliver. So if you use, like, depending on, on the level of the uh, resistance of the coil, you could increase the power, which means the wattage level, the power uh, of uh, atomization. Very soon, electronics entered and dominated uh, the cigarettes. So initially, we were having variable voltage devices with electronic circuits which would allow stable voltage delivery until the battery gets fully discharged. So, so you should know that the lithium batteries start at a level of 4, 4.1 volts, but they gradually decrease the voltage ability uh, until they get up to 3.2 approximately. Uh, so with these devices, you could consistently get the amount of voltage that you have that you set on your device without uh, irrespective of what the battery uh, was able to give they were they had some uh, voltage boosters uh, into their uh, circuit uh, so from uh, the variable voltage device when we went to variable wattage devices which is the correct way to move forward because it is the power basically and uh, which is uh, we, which is uh, important for the evaporation rate and the amount of aerosol production, the amount of liquid consumption. Basically, it is joules. It's the, um, uh, it's, it's the product of power and path duration which defines all this. But the correct thing is to set the power levels, uh, the wattage, not the voltage. Because we, when you set the voltage, if you attach two atomizers of different resistance, you will have huge differences in the power levels. So at initially, the devices were pretty big, but they are getting very, very small. And they become more and more potent, going from something like 10 watts, uh, the initial devices, up to now 100. And you can see even here 200 watts of power delivery. Uh, this probably is using two batteries. Uh, b b and this also is using uh, two uh, lithium batteries. So they are getting really, really hot. There are also some devices with some fancy features. Here's a device I found yesterday on the internet where you, you can connect it with your Bluetooth. You can speak on the phone through the device. It has a microphone and a speaker, believe it or not. So there's no need to touch the phone. There's a button where you can answer the call, and you can speak through this microphone, through the speaker. And of course, it also plays music from your phone through Bluetooth connection. <laughs> Amazing. It is sold right now. It's from 2014. I found it in a UK e-shop. Interesting. Uh, in terms of the atomizers, uh, we had some further developments. We had, first of all, the introduction of what we call rebuildable atomizers, or RBAs, the, the, the experienced vapors know them. Uh, these are atomizers uh, where you can fully disassemble them and you are preparing, the user, I mean, is preparing the coil and wick setup himself, as he wants. He can use different type of wicking materials, different type of coil metals, different uh, uh, thickness of the metal, different, different styles of, 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 of um, uh, coil wraps, as you can see here, for example, it is uh, many, many wraps which are attached, one, one is touching the other. This is using stainless steel mesh instead of using silica or cotton wick. Um, it gave the ability, and there were also some tank systems which are the buildables, it gave the ability to the consumer to adjust the, um, the way he, he, he vapes based on how he prepared the coil. There was a lot of experimentation, and people like to adjust the products to their own personal preference. I mean, it's, it's acceptable. Uh, with these devices, we also saw the trend of sub-bomb vaping. Uh, when we're talking about sub-bomb vaping, we're talking about the, um, uh, making uh, coils which, have, which are of very, very low resistance, uh, less than one ohm, in some cases less than 0 0.5 ohms. Uh, which meant that with a mechanical mode you could use very high power levels, 
uh, and also with a new generation uh, variable wattage device, you can get up to 100 or 200 uh, wattage levels. And Constantine, it's just a warning. You've had 15 minutes, so I've had already. Yeah. No, I'll, I'll have I'll have 18. Uh, and and of course that started the trend of the. I have some very nice videos, please. Direct lung inhalation. We can you can see here an idea of a direct lung inhalation if it plays, and it does not. But it doesn't matter because I have it here, and I'm going to show you. What is the direct lung inhalation? It's very, very interesting. What's the full screen? Yeah. That's the, what we call cloud chasing. Look at the amount of vapor. He's inhaling directly into the lung. As you understand, it's impossible to inhale that much volume of uh, aerosol into the mouth. And they're exhaling all those clouds of, of, of uh, vapor, as you saw. Uh, so to, to speed up things, I'll continue at the same pace, sorry. Uh, new generation atomizers uh, are also, you know, commercial, how we, as we call atomizers, are also made to adjust to the needs of the, of the, of the consumer. So they have developed, all the big Chinese companies, they have developed uh, these types of atomizers where you can also use them for sub-ohm vaping and for direct lung inhalation. Sub-ohm vaping, as I'm saying here, is a new trend. We're talking about huge puff volumes of more than one liter per puff. Huge liquid consumption per puff, which can be up to 30 milligrams per puff or even more. Similar temperature of evaporation compared to the, to the conventional vaping because I have measured that. But significant elevation, usually significant elevation in daily liquid consumption because all these consumers cannot vape high levels of nicotine. So they have to reduce the levels of nicotine to very low concentrations because nicotine is very irritant at those, those levels. So they are increasing a lot their liquid consumption. Uh, we didn't have any evolution in bottles, uh, in liquids. Uh, there are many, many flavors, but there is little research on bottle materials. Temperature control is already in the market, and it's a very important development. Deborah, I remember you telling me last year about this. And again, I have to play the video from here. Um, and you will see now what's happening where there is no temperature control. You see, you, it is cotton, of course. That's why it's catching fire. But you can understand the amount of... Uh, uh, of heat generated, and now the same device set at the same power level, look what's happening when you have temperature control at around 230 degrees. Very little vapor depending on how much liquid, there's very little liquid there, but as you see there is no overheating, there is no uh, fire, there is nothing happening because the device can control the temperature in the coil and it can get higher from what uh, you have set it uh, as, a, as a maximum level. So it does work. There are some problems. It is based on the temperature coefficient of resistance principle, and, but you need specific uh, metals in the coils that have a stable alpha value. As you see here, the alpha value is the percentage change in resistance for every one, per, one uh, degree Celsius increase in temperature. Uh, one issue is that all these uh, wires usually are low resistance and it makes difficult the accurate determination of the resistance change. And there may be some other materials besides nickel and titanium that can be used, but that has not been thoroughly examined yet. I have one in my, in my pocket, but I'm not going to show you. <laughs> the future developments I'm finishing. Uh, is the uh, delivery of high power levels, but to control the temperature, as I said, it's basically here and it's in continuously improving. Uh, it is a big step forward, I think, uh, because even the most careless users will never be exposed. Although I don't think it makes a, a big difference because under normal vaping conditions, we, thought, we saw that the um, uh, thermal degradation products are not are at very low levels. Um, another future development will be the improvement in battery efficiency, which will make the devices smaller, more acceptable in terms of size and shape, but will have high capacity so they can last long. The improved design atomizer heads to succeed in having the best possible liquid supply rate to the week, so that we can have a lot of aerosol production with less chance of overheating. 
uh, we must define at some point a balance between the resistance levels, the coil thickness, and the power delivery. The people who are using 100 and 200 watts of power, they are using it for a simple reason. They have very thick coils that need a lot of power to be heated. And they are using cotton, which gets very, is very absorptive. It gets uh, very, very wet. So if you use uh, lower power levels with those devices, you will see no vapor coming out. Um, it is important in the future to avoid heating as a method of aerosol production, to avoid the metal coils, and to avoid the contact between the liquid, which is a corrosive liquid, with the metal parts of the atomizer. And of course, it would be important to find further ways to reduce aldehyde emissions, either by trapping them or finding alternative compounds as basic ingredients which do not generate uh, aldehydes uh, by thermal decomposition. Thank you very much. Thank you, Constantinos. Um, can I ask the speakers to come up to the front? Uh, could I ask the speakers to come up to the front?